All right, everyone, welcome to this webinar today um, by Australian Chronic Infectious and Inflammatory Disease Society. Uh, we're very, very excited to have Dr. Bruce Patterson with us today, speaking about long COVID. Uh, but before we hand over to him, I'd like to first uh, just hand over to Dr. Ashley Berry, who's the, the current president of ACIDS, to talk uh, a little bit about who we are and um, why being a member of ACIDS can be a really beneficial thing. Thank you, Sandeep. No worries. I'll just go ahead and share my screen here. Sure. Thanks, Sandeep. So ACIDS uh, was established in 2013 to support integrative doctors who at that time were feeling fairly isolated uh, and having generally a difficult time being getting established. Kathy Morris was actually the first president and the inaugural meeting involved um, Peter Main, who we all know of, uh, Andrew Adams, and of course, Richard Schlofel, who was our recent president. Our aim in ACIDS really is to have integrative medicine as a recognized, well-developed, patient-oriented, evolving, and the emphasis is on evolving uh, an evidence-based specialty. So we're always ever changing. We get new information and our, our protocols change. Our board meets every two months and there's actually a surprising amount of activity that goes on in the, back, in the background. Our first guidelines as on the slides were created in 2013, 2014. Uh, so we're actually an inclusive group of progressive doctors who actually share a lot of knowledge. We are not jealous with our knowledge. We share it very, quite, quite willingly. Uh, we have a, an excellent email forum uh, where we have uh, a lot of information discussed. If you've got a difficult clinical case, you can bring that up and you will get a lot of good information on this internet forum. And I think that's one of the main things with ACIDS, the willingness to share information and the level of expertise. At our last meeting, it ended up as a question and answer session. And seriously, the information there was outstanding. We also have monthly uh, lectures via Zoom, where we might talk on, again, clinically relevant things, and we offer each other a lot of support during difficult times. Now, ACIDS, I think maybe in the next slide, um, yeah. So ACIDS has expanded the range of conditions it covers. So initially, it was mainly looking at vector-borne disease, which, uh, as we know, doesn't really exist in Australia, according to the government. Uh, but now we've ex ex extended to mold heavy metal toxicity, EMF, mast cell related conditions, long COVID, and really all aspects of integrative medicine. Again, as I emphasized at a very high level. Initially, ACIDS provided testimony to the Lyme-like illness Senate inquiry, uh, to the SIRS parliamentary inquiry, and recently to the medical board. Um, unfortunately, those, the last, um, efforts of us was kind of basically ignored. So we have documented protocols on vector-borne disease on our website, on our, in our library, and we're always changing this and we're gonna to add to it. Now, for new members joining assets at this stage of the year, we're offering a discounted price of $90 only for the first year. Um, and I think on the next slide, or at the bottom of the slide, is if you click on that link, you can then uh, get membership very easily. Um, and that's all I have to say before I hand back to Sandeep to talk about Dr. Bruce Patterson. Great, thanks very much, Ashley. And we'll, we'll put um, the link uh, in the chat window. So anyone wanting to go in and uh, apply can do so. All right, so now on to the main event. So I'd like to just spend a couple of moments introducing Dr. Patterson. Dr. Patterson actually uh, is a, a resident of California, but he received his undergraduate training uh, in molecular biology from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He then received his medical degree at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, followed by a residency in pathology. During the early stages of the AIDS epidemic, Dr. Patterson began investigating cellular reservoirs of HIV-1, uh, 
using molecular and in situ cell-based technology patented in his laboratory and used today throughout the world. Dr. Patterson determined that enough HIV virus was present in infected individuals to account for the massive destruction of the immune system that people saw in HIV-related disease. The, this paradigm-altering work was published in Science in 1993 and has been featured in Scientific American, Rolling Stone, and on the Discovery Channel. So he's a little bit of a rock star of the, the medicine scene. Uh, he's authored over 150 manuscripts and book chapters focusing on single cell biology and diagnostics. Dr. Patterson was formerly an associate professor of pathology and infectious diseases and director of virology at Stanford University. He currently serves as CEO and founder of Incel DX Incorporated, a growth stage company that has translated his research discoveries into state of the art single cell diagnostics in cancer, immuno-oncology, and infectious diseases, especially COVID-19. So without any further ado, um, we'll hand over to Dr. Bruce Patterson. Thank you, Sandeep. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And it's, um, like uh, I told the group before we all came on, um, Australia is one of my favorite places um, to visit. And I wish I was there uh, in person um, with all of you. Now, if can I share my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to talk to you today about um, the pathogenesis um, and treatment of chronic inflammatory um, diseases. And this is a this is a talk I gave at the um, post-infectious encephalopathy conference at Georgetown a few weeks ago with some some new information that we've gleaned. Um, in the past uh, few weeks, uh, but you know, we, we we have been working on long COVID for about two years now before you, people even knew there was long COVID. And how it came about was uh, I was in China in January of 2020 and was told about um, this viral infection, and I was supposed to go to Wuhan for a business meeting, uh, which got canceled. Uh, and then I saw some of the early data from some of these patients uh, and saw what a real um, cytokine storm uh, and immunologic chaos looked like in some of these early patients. So I came back to the States and started working on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and started clinical trials of some CCR5 antagonists um, in, in the acute phase. And they were actually very, very effective, um, and you know, albeit very difficult to get through um, the FDA. We still still saw some very interesting things from a pathogenesis uh, standpoint, including the fact that COVID, acute COVID, is really a um, macrophage disease. One, uh, of course, that elicits the innate immune response um, because we've never seen the virus before. Uh, and that really entails the liberation uh, of a chaotic and um, overzealous uh, immune response uh, that includes uh, what uh, Joe Belanti and other immunologists like to call damaging immunity. And I think that's a really good term. We all know about innate immunity, humoral immunity, adaptive immunity, cell-based immunity. But the reality is there are certain aspects of an immune response that can be tissue damaging. Um, and again, when you think about IL-6, TNF-alpha, uh, and some of the other cytokines, that's exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Now, what's that, what that's led to is, um, is what is called PASC, which is a um, very difficult name, I think, to, to use for this condition. And, uh, when we first learned about it was in following patients on in, in acute COVID, we noticed that at 40 days and 60 days, um, they were better. Um, they were discharged from the hospital. They didn't die. Um, but by no stretch of the imagination was the immune system even close to being normal. Um, in the beginning, we looked at over 150 um, plasma-based and cell-based uh, biomarkers. And these patients just were not normal um, for the most part at, at 40 days, 60 days. 
and, and, and some even 90 days. And, and of course, the, the current number is about 10 to 30 percent of those with acute COVID will go on to be uh, long haulers. I think that number is real, uh, maybe even higher, although I'll submit that um, there's reasons why there's um, some confounding uh, elements to um, that diagnosis. Uh, and, and again, we're now up to, uh, it, through the COVID long hauler uh, program at www.covidlonghaulers.com, um, which is our uh, arm for diagnosing, treating, and um, monitoring long COVID patients. We're up to 20,000 patients. So we have a significant um, base of data um, to, to do a, very, a variety of different studies. We've published extensively. I think we're up to now six or seven uh, long COVID uh, publications and, and more to follow, um, which I'll go through uh, in the following slides. One of the things that was very uh, uh, striking uh, in this data, which is from acute COVID, was the fact that we all knew that there was elevated IL-6, which you oversee here in panel A, and this is from an article in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases. But one of the things that really struck me was how low the CD8 percent was uh, in these individuals, and, and others had reported low CD4, um, we didn't, that didn't reach statistical significance um, relative to healthy individuals, but low CD8 count surely was um, statistically significant. And, and pathognomonic uh, of acute COVID, and when we follow, started following long COVID um, individuals, uh, about 25% of long COVID um, uh, patients also have, and still have, uh, low CD8 percentages, um, which I'll get into uh, in a moment. So, you know, early on when we were looking at these acute patients, we decided to model um, these patients who had prolonged disease or else got better. And then, you know, 60 to 90 days uh, after that started to get the, the symptoms that we all uh, have heard about. And um, we were the first to publish that using machine learning that uh, they had a completely different um, cytokine profile. And when we looked at some of these uh, cell-based immunologic markers, they also had elevated uh, monocytes, in particular uh, intermediate and non-classical monocytes. And they also had elevated B cells. Now, that gave us a tip off that, that maybe some of these individuals um, were reactivating um, viruses that cause true latency, main, main, mainly the herpes family viruses, EBV, CMV, HSV, HHV6, varicella, because of this low CD8 percent. Um, and so we, we did see that in some of those individuals. Um, but I will caution, um, there was a paper that just came out in Nature Communications about predicting who's going to become a uh, long COVID by certain parameters and acute COVID. One of them was Epstein-Barr. And I would submit that that is actually an exacerbation of MECFS and not long COVID because as I'll show you later, we, we now categorize pure PASC and PASC plus and PASC plus incorporates MECFS, fibromyalgia, uh, post Lyme and, and other conditions that can also uh, have identical symptoms to long COVID. Um, there was a uh, there was a response to an interview I gave one time where a, a physician said, "Oh, we don't need diagnostics in long COVID because we know what the symptoms are." Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, we know what the symptoms are, but there happens to be four other very common conditions that have the exact same symptoms, including, as I'll show you post-vaccination uh, long haulers. So um, we have to get out of that mindset. And you know, the, we just submitted this paper on this new classification scheme, which I'll show you. But we made the point that in order to do uh, uh, clinical trials, in order to come up with appropriate therapies, we must, must make the distinction between pure PASC or long COVID ME-CFS, 
post-treatment Lyme disease or PTLD, fibromyalgia, and even post-vaccination long haulers. But back to you know, the CD8 story. Um, what we're seeing is obviously very low CD8s and reactivation of some of these herpes family viruses, um, which is fairly common in the patients that we see because now we include MECFS and, and others. There's also chronic uh, viral infections, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. We haven't seen uh, um, uh, exacerbations or recrudescence of some of those infections. Of course, HIV, which is a proviral-based uh, latency, uh, we haven't looked uh, too much into that. Um, but it still remains that these patients uh, in the acute phase of COVID have very low CD8 percentages, which we have to take into account as we're um, evaluating these patients uh, and monitoring them uh, over time. And, and again, there was this interesting um, uh, table from the WHO, which, which showed the number of people uh, worldwide who have long COVID. Uh, and then interestingly enough, included a common uh, co a column of the number of people who may get MECFS. And the question I had on this table was, how many people were acutely infected with MECFS related viruses, EBV, CMV, et cetera, or just showed reactivation? And I think that's a really important um, consideration. And I had developed a test at Stanford that uh, looked at RNA to DNA ratios for the chronic herpes virus, which I think is really the only way to tell if there's reactivation. The serology is very confusing. Uh, and confounding and um, and difficult to interpret. So um, we are uh, going to be coming out soon with um, uh, with RNA to DNA ratio uh, assays for EBV and and CMB. Now, um, one of the papers that we published last year, uh, which gave us a hint as to what might be going on, was that um, we did see. Um, some SARS-CoV viral shedding, meaning replication, um, up to about 90 days in individuals um, that had impaired uh, T cell responses. And again, these were patients with low CD8 T cells. So again, we started measuring in mutant cell subsets as part of our routine um, uh, laboratory evaluation of long haulers. Um, but we also were struck with the question that's very similar to Lyme, meaning is the, is the virus still there or is the bug still there and is it replicating or is it just um, bits and pieces uh, or some people call it debris or some people call it persistence. Um, so that was, a, that was a question that we had to back in our minds is just how long can you see replication competent virus um, in these individuals. And there's been studies looking at this in, in tissue, but they use technologies like DDPCR, which we used in acute um, COVID and showed DDPCR positive uh, plasma. And in fact, plasma viral load was part of our first uh, acute COVID paper, but we could never culture virus out of plasma, which told us that indeed there's fragments of SARS-CoV-2 floating around the body, but whether or not it's replication competent is a whole nother story. Um, and, and of course, we saw a wave of people trying monoclonal antibodies and other treatments, now Paxlovid for long COVID with no success, because frankly, you know, we, uh, and I'll get to this in a moment, but we really feel that there are fragments, there's pers antigen, per persistent antigenemia, persistent antigen presentation by monocytes. But when we sequenced the virus, um, there was only fragments of RNA out to um, 15 months. We've now replicated that uh, in tissue where less than 5% of the SARS-CoV-2 genome was represented in three uh, long COVID um, patient biopsies. But back to the symptoms um, and, and correctly classifying um, these conditions. Um, these, this is a table that we pre present in our first paper in Frontiers in Immunology of the, of the symptoms that we were seeing. Uh, and we overlaid that with, uh, with the red splotches, which are 
the symptoms that are common in ME, CFS. Uh, again, some have said that long COVID may, may cause up to 200 plus uh, different uh, symptoms, uh, which could be true. But the, the, the major issue is that fatigue, post-exertional um, malaise, brain fog are so common in long COVID. And then initially, um, when we were starting to expand our horizons from long COVID, starting to see that that was a primary symptom uh, in MECFS. What's really fascinating is a paper um, we just submitted for peer review on post-vaccination long haulers. And believe it or not, the same spectrum of symptoms, neuropathy, brain fog, fatigue, post-exertional post, you know, post malaise, uh, shortness of breath, all the ones you see in, um, in long COVID were seen in some individuals post-vaccination. And again, I wanna caution that this is probably a very, very low percentage of individuals getting vaccinated. However, we're, we're treating about 1,500 of these patients. So, you know, the number's large just because the number of people who've been vaccinated is large. It's a side effect indeed, but it's treatable uh, as I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. And, and some of these symptoms vary by the type of vaccine, which I've shown up here in the upper right, uh, but I won't get into that in any great detail other than to say, some post-vaccination long haulers, again, have identical symptoms. So now we have three, you know, three conditions, long COVID long haulers, MECFS, uh, post-vaccination long haulers. And of course, um, that also applies to post-Lyme uh, and fibromyalgia. I won't go into any great detail on this slide, but this was just all the different biomarkers we looked at in both acute COVID, uh, later on in long COVID. And um, our machine learning and AI allowed us to choose from all of these biomarkers. So it was basically interleukin zero to a thousand, um, plus you know uh, everything else you could possibly think of um, under the sun. And so um, it's been very helpful to have AI uh, to help us with choosing what would be appropriate in these chronic inflammatory conditions. What's, what's, what's very interesting is that, you know, um, just by happenstance, um, we and the computer chose representative markers of innate immunity, adaptive immunity, humoral immunity, um, um, cell mediated immunity, and damaging immunity, uh, and even uh, uh, allergic. Uh, you know, uh, conditions where we added in IL-4 and IL-13, of course. So um, it, it's really turned out to be a robust, reproducible, uh, and very helpful uh, panel. And it's what we call Insulkine. Um, we sell it in the States. We sell it uh, now uh, all over Europe. And get, now we're moving into South America and, and hopefully at some point into um uh, Southeast Asia and Australia. But the important part in terms of the validation of this panel came when we overlaid all the cytokines for all five of these conditions together. And the dark, in, in this heat map, the darker the square, the closer the association. So, of course, you know, each cytokine is highly associated with itself. But we saw associations like IL 13 and interleukin 4. Well, it just so happens that they're co-expressed, they're part of the type two inflammatory response, and they should be uh, closely uh, linked. The other one uh, that gave us great confidence in the panel was interferon gamma and IL-2. So uh, interferon gamma, uh, and interleukin 10, I mean, and interferon gamma induces interleukin 10 uh, expression. So, you know, we, we've, we've validated this assay every way you can possibly think. We've validated it technically in different labs, lab to lab responsive uh, re um, reproducibility. We've um, validated it biologically, as you can see here, uh, against uh, known cytokine associations. We also, as I'll show in a minute, validated it clinically. So 
you know, um, people are still saying that our diagnostics or our, our approach hasn't been validated and, and there's really no truth to that anymore. And, and, and all of this has been published. The other thing is we found this really striking um, association between what was our long hauler score in our first um, paper on machine learning and severity score for acute COVID. But what they really represented was uh, these associations uh, of certain cytokines. And you can see where we see this nice distinction of long haulers, <coughs> which is in yellow. Um, in red, you see the post-vaccination long haulers. And in blue, you see the um, MECFS patients. And what's interesting here is um, the um, post-vaccination long haulers and MECFS have lower severity scores than um, long haulers. And it's because uh, in MECFS and in post-vaccination long haulers, you see much higher interleukin-8 expression than you do in long COVID. So we use interleukin-8 uh, as a key differentiator when we're trying to decide uh, how to treat these individuals. Um, we're just now lay overlaying uh, uh, Lyme on this, post-Lyme, uh, and they're actually looking more like um, acute COVID than um, than, than long COVID, but I'll get into that uh, in a moment or I'll get into it right now. Um, this is actually the machine learning uh, confusion matrix that we used for all of these conditions, which is extremely important because remember, these all have the same, <coughs> same symptoms. So being able to tell the difference between each of these conditions is absolutely paramount for effective therapy and for effective um, clinical trial design, uh, et cetera. And, you know, for the most part, and in the lighter the color on this heat map, um, the, the, the more uh, tight the um, call is for that particular condition. And so of course, you know, we're very good at this point of, um, of calling pure PASC, meaning not PASC plus, not MECFS, not Epstein Barr or CMV driven <coughs> conditions that have the same symptoms, but true pure PASC. And as I'll show you in the preprint of the article that's out for peer review right now, where we actually use this classification scheme as our entry and exclusion criteria for a clinical trial design that is identical to what we'll be submitting uh, to the FDA for two drugs, Maravarac and statins. We were very successful at calling pure PASC, <clears throat> and that was reflected uh, in the very profound um, improvement in symptoms uh, in those individuals. But again, we're able to call very nicely mild to moderate and severe um, um, uh, COVID, uh, post-vax, and, um, and Lyme had a little bit of overlap. MECFS actually was called um, very, very well. Um, but really, post-vax and Lyme were the only two that were, um, quote, confused to some extent. But we know from taking the history and physical, or at least talking to these individuals um, who had a history of Lyme, who had, you know, symptoms 90 days after getting vaccination. So, you know, once we uh, redo our bioinformatics, including uh, symptoms and clinical parameters, I think we'll be able to even further uh, define uh, this confusion matrix. Then we found this interesting paper by Shet et al. in New England Journal last summer, which used a, a cytokine nodal-based classification scheme for autoimmune diseases, um, also of colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, which previously had been categorized by, um, by organ. Um, the one thing that was very different from what we had been studying is that none, of, I mean, very few of these have similar symptoms. You're not going to confuse ulcerative colitis with uh, lupus or psoriatic arthritis, but they did come up with a uh, cytokine signature-based uh, classification scheme that we thought was a very interesting way 
that we might further characterize the four or five conditions that have similar symptoms that we're dealing with right now, including uh, COVID long haulers. And we did just that. We developed a cytokine nodal classification. I know this is very small. Each one of these boxes represents a different cytokine with a different um, normalized cutoff. And we're able to very nicely categorize uh, MECFS in purple, uh, pass, pure PASC in green, uh, post-vaccination long haulers in blue, um, Lyme over here in pink, uh, and then of course, acute COVID here in orange and, and light orange. So this is a very effective classification. And, and we thought, just like you're probably thinking, oh, why do we care about acute COVID in this, um, uh, in this classification scheme? Well, you know what? Nothing was more um, useful in January than this classification scheme when all of our long haulers were being reinfected by Omicron and or we were getting MECFS patients infected with Omicron. And so we were able using this classification scheme, which is um, summarized here in a much easier, um, understandable way um, to say, well, you know, this really looks from an immunologic standpoint, like you had acute COVID on top of your MECFS or you had acute COVID on top of your your Lyme or, 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 or long COVID. So um, this has been extremely useful. And we've talked to another, a uh, number of other investigators, for instance, you know, with, um, with uh, MECFS, you know, and of course, TNF alpha interferon gamma are just hallmarks of MECFS. We actually have relatively, this is uh, CCL5 is here, but it's actually low CCL5. So um, one of the hallmarks of MECFS that differentiates it from PASC that has low CCL5 relative to PASC. And then interesting enough, IL-2 and interferon are in the PASC pathway. And our previous algorithm used IL-2 and interferon gamma as a long hauler index. So again, we're using different um, statistical uh, machine learning AI techniques uh, and coming up with similar results uh, approaching them from from much different um, much different uh, categories. So now what? Uh, of course, you know it's not all about diagnostics. Um, for us, it was about treatment, um, and that started for us again two years ago. We were one of the first to recognize that there was long COVID. We knew there was an immunologic abnormality, and you know we sought to to reverse that immunologic abnormality. So we took our panel, again, that had been developed by AI, um, and clearly we had a armamentarium of drugs that we knew either from our work uh, or the literature um, would bring down various uh, cytokines. And we really felt at the time, which we didn't prove until uh, our recent paper, that if you normalize the immune system and normalize the cytokines, you would normalize the symptoms. And that was the holy grail for us and what we had been seeking, not only that, but also what is the underlying cause of long COVID, which I'll also get to in a moment. But we, we looked at a number of different drugs and we knew what they did to the various cytokines. And I'll get into that uh, in more detail in a moment. But when we gave, um, our two main drugs, Maraviroc um, and Prevastatin, because they covered the spectrum uh, of cytokines here. Um, we used uh, symptom scores that have been accepted in uh, FDA clinical trials for, for several years for other purposes. So for instance, uh, the Rankin uh, neurology score, when we treated patients, and this was patients treated with Maraviroc 300 milligrams BID and Prevastatin 10 milligrams uh, QDA. Um, we saw a statistically significant uh, decrease in the Rankin score between six to 12 weeks. And most importantly, our statistician said, okay, so you're, you're improving the symptom scores. What biomarkers are correlated with improvement in which symptoms? 
And that has been the most important information on how we manage patients today. You know, we originally managed them on long hauler index and indeed long hauler index is a nice quantitative way um, to monitor response to therapy. But for instance, now, you know, neurologic symptoms, while well, soluble CD40 ligand and VEGF are very much related uh, to neurologic uh, symptom improvement. Compass 31, which is dysautonomia, uh, which is very common in long COVID, um, VEGF, soluble CD40 ligand, and GM-CSF were highly correlated with very strong p-values with the um, statistically significant improvement in dysautonomia with Maraviroc uh, and statins. Shortness of breath, um, not the most common symptom that we see in long COVID. When we see it, it's mostly mechanical. It's because the pleura is inflamed, the you know the 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 cartilage is inflamed in the you know in the rib cage, um, maybe even the periosteum or the sternum because their O2 sats are normal. But when we saw shortness of breath, GM CSF um, lowering is the one that correlates most with a very significant p value uh, to improvement uh, in shortness of breath. But here's the big one because this is the one common across the board in all uh, six of these conditions, and that is fatigue. And this is the fatigue score that's gonna be required on every single long COVID um, clinical trial uh, in the United States by the FDA. And again, when we used our uh, entry criteria and exclusion criteria, we saw profound statistical significance in fatigue scores over six to 12 weeks and very, very strong correlation with very low p-values, 10 to the minus fifth, between TNF-alpha and interleukin-2 um, with fatigue. And indeed, when we're treating patients now uh, and they have elevated TNF-alpha, uh, our sole goal is to get TNF-alpha down. And there's no drug, um, maybe Humira is better, I don't know yet, but uh, Maraviroc is amazing at bringing down five cytokines or chemokines, CCL5 or RANTES, of course, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, VEGF, soluble CD40 ligand are all brought down by, um, uh, by Maraviroc. And uh, of course, the statins bring down IL-2 and interferon gamma uh, for reasons that I'll show you uh, in a moment. So... So cardiac function obviously has um, correlation with GMCFS uh, and interleukin-8. Um, but the thing is about, um, you know, about POTS, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, based on the mechanism, is these patients are vasodilated. If they're vasodilated, um, their blood pressure is going to go down. The blood pressure goes, goes down, their heart rate goes up. So, you know, and I'll show you. Uh, what we believe is causing uh, the vasodilatation in these individuals. They have hot and cold insensitivity. They have brain fog. They have headaches and migraines, which of course are vasodilatation of brain, uh, blood vessels in the brain. Um, but uh, what we found in COVID long haulers, which we published in Frontiers of Immunology in January, is that we found um, the SARS-CoV to S1 protein um, in non-classical and intermediate um, monocytes, as you see here. So CD14 low, T16 positive are uh, non-classical uh, monocytes. Uh, CD14 positive, CD16 positive are intermediate uh, monocytes. Um, and of course, CD14 double positive, CD16 negative are classical monocytes. What's interesting is these all express different cell surface receptors. Classical monocytes express zero CCR5, but they express the ACE2 receptor. So these cells aren't getting infected, okay? And the intermediate monocytes express high levels of CCR5, and they also express the fractal kind receptor, okay? And they migrate all over the body and intermediate monocytes, uh, we published a paper in 2008 
showing that intermediate monocytes because they express CCR5 are the monocyte subset that gets infected by HIV. It's all, these cells are also because they express CD71, the um, CD81, I mean, uh, they uh, can also be infected by hepatitis C, productively infected, which we published again in 2008. Well, it turns out uh, these intermediate and non-classical monocytes are involved in Zika, dengue fever, to get these viruses into the brain. Also, um, it's been shown that these cells carry uh, the Borrelia peptidoglycan in Lyme disease in the absence of replicating bacteria. And here we have the same situation in, um, in COVID where um, these monocytes are carrying the S1 protein uh, of SARS-CoV-2. And we showed, we confirmed the flow cytometry using mass spec where we sorted the cells, looked at protein lysates. This upper panel is the control, which is store-bought S1 protein. And here are long haulers, all with S1 protein in their CD16 positive monocytes. We also sorted these monocytes and purified their RNA and did whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, and there was nothing but fragments at 15 months. There was no replication competent virus. There was less than 10% of the genome that was represented um, in the sequencing of these cells. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't detect it by PCR. You couldn't detect it using um, uh, in situ hybridization. Some people went so far as to say using immunohistic chemistry, which just detects protein, they were then concluding that there must be replicating virus, which is absurd. So I would caution against reports of, uh, that, that, that take this great leap of faith from the presence of RNA or the presence of protein and the fact that there's replication competent virus. And that's why we've gone to so much work to sequence the entire genome, both in um, this paper that came out in Frontiers of Immunology in January, um, and, um, and in three uh, gut biopsies from three long COVID individuals where we found uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA, but it represented less than 5% of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Interestingly enough, we followed the same set of experiments in post-vaccination individuals who have long hauler symptoms, and we found S1 protein in their CD16 positive monocytes. What was really interesting is not only did we find the S1 protein, but we found S2, of course, because the vaccines induce or, or, or introduce S. Um, so we found S1, we found S2, and we found some mutations in, um, um, in S1, which we don't know what the um, ramifications of, of that uh, are or could be in terms of uh, immune responsiveness. So why is this important in terms of the pathogenesis of long COVID? Well, what's fascinating, and this is from the immunology literature around 2010 to 2013, these non-classical monocytes bind to endothelial cells um, and can cause endothelial inflammation. Um, and you know what they do? They produce a type one cytokine response, interferon gamma, interleukin two, which our computer happened to tell us was the long hauler index. This paper was from 2013, okay? And then the fact that these cells also carry S1, can induce antibody responses. This is why we think patients get worse when they get, uh, long haulers get worse when they get vaccinated. They certainly got worse when people tried monoclonal antibodies, which targeted S1. That was a disaster and sent some of our patients to the emergency room. But the fact is these cells are doing what they are supposed to do. They're patrolling the, the endothelium, but they're call, causing endotheliitis. Well, what does endotheliitis do? Well, so here are the non-classical monocytes. They express the um, fractal kind receptor, 
they bind to fractal kind, which is which is expressed on endothelial cells. And that expression can be lowered by statins. Okay, that's extremely important. The other thing is in the absence of fractal kind, these cells die. So the cells carrying the S1 protein die because they can't engage with fractal kind. Um, and in the absence, when they do engage um, and they do carry foreign proteins, um, their apoptotic program is uh, short circuited, meaning they're long lived when their normal lifespan uh, is only a week. But what happens when they bind to the vascular endothelium through uh, fractal kind? Angiogenesis, production of VEGF. VEGF also causes peripheral neuropathy. So as we showed in, in that outcome paper, you lower VEGF, you lower the dysautonomy, you lower the neur neuropathy uh, in these individuals. The other thing it causes is vasodilatation. You get this universal sign of long COVID, which is this. I showed this on a on a on a on a Dr. Drew show in the United States. I said, you know, every single patient with long COVID says, my head feels like this. That's almost a universal sign of long COVID. Um, because they have this sense of headfulness. Uh, they have headaches, they have migraines, they have brain fog, you know, all due to vasodilatation. So when we block the migration of these cells, which express CCR5 using CCR5 antagonist, Maraviroc, and we lower the fractal kind expression and block this interaction with statins, these patients get better. And that's what I showed in the outcome study. And that's the design of our clinical trial for Maraviroc and statins that we're going to take through the FDA. But this is the mechanism underlying that. Now, the other, uh, the other uh, consequence of endotheliitis is exposure of collagen, activation of platelets. That's why S-soluble CD40 ligand is a platelet activation marker. We've had that in there for two years because we knew that platelets became activated and were a setup for clotting. So we wanted to monitor that. We wanted to make sure that when we treated, we eliminated the cause for platelet activation and platelet binding because this also exposes collagen. You activate the monomyloband pathway. You ac activate all the clotting pathways that we hear a lot about in terms of microclots. The problem is you got to remove the underlying cause and that is the vascular inflammation. I mean, you can sit there and drain microclots all day long with apheresis or whatever, but at the end of the day, you haven't done anything for the vascular inflammation, so they'll come back. Uh, we've seen that in a number of different patients. So the bottom line is you've got to treat the vascular inflammation the Maraviroc Prevostatin combination has been really profoundly uh, useful uh, in that regard, as you can see from the outcome study that we, we published. So um, I'd like to thank, obviously, all of my collaborators. Um, they've been incredible. The, the number of collaborators we have worldwide has grown and grown and grown since we first started this. Um, we're talking to um, you know, all the, the major groups working on this. And um, um, we're not going to stop talking about it. We're not going to stop investigating um, all the elements uh, of long COVID. But I think it is absolutely critical to know if you're dealing with true long COVID or you're dealing with an exacerbation of MECFS, PTLD, fibromyalgia, uh, or post-vaccination long haulers. I can't tell you how many telemedicines I've sat in where um, the patient will come in and say, well, you know, I've had long COVID, I COVID this day and that. And then towards the end of the end of the discussion, they'll say, oh yeah, by the way, I have EBV. 
by the way, I had mono, you know, four years ago. Oh, by the way, I, I was bitten by a tick and I had Lyme three years ago. These are all very prevalent diseases. In fact, I had a long hauler um, from my town in California who was, we got her back to normal, got her immune system back to normal, her symptoms um, were almost gone. And she gets bitten by a tick three weeks ago and as Borrelia. So strange things happen. Um, we had one person who came in who had brain fog. Uh, it wasn't until the third visit that um, they told us, he told us that he had been electrocuted. And then he's had brain fog ever since he was electrocuted. So we've heard it all. Um, we've seen it all. And what we're trying to do is um, really make sure that we uh, put people in the right category so we can effectively treat them. So for instance, for ME-CFS, um, you know, in the absence of our RNA-DNA ratio assays, which are, are coming, um, we'll treat Revaltrex uh, and suppress their, their herpes viruses. If we get their immune system back to normal and they're still having symptoms, we'll put them on Valtrex. Or, you know, for Lyme, um, we'll make sure that we coordinate with their Lyme doctors to ensure that they've had proper antibiotic therapy. Um, and um, and it, when they have, and the, the, the Lyme doctors are pretty assured that there's no replicating organism uh, there anymore, those are the ones who really respond to the therapy that's in, uh, correcting their uh, immunology. So uh, I would just hope that everyone can consider that just because these people have the symptoms that we're hearing more and more about with long COVID doesn't mean it's pure long COVID. So we talk a lot about PASC and PASC plus in our group and um, we have to treat them uh, accordingly um, to be successful. So I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Um, really, that's why I'm here. Um, so uh, fire away. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. That was very, very interesting and a lot of new information for many of us.